Greetings. Welcome to video number 12 and the conclusion of Data Science Dojo's intro to text analytics with R. I am your host, Dave Langer. Okay, per our process, what I've got here is a handy dandy R Studio environment with all the code executed through the end of video 11. Now, where we ended up in video 11 was a bad spot. Specifically, we saw that on our test run, our Mighty Random Forest, which scored over 97% accuracy in our cross-validation runs, in fact scored quite a bit less, almost 11% less in accuracy. As you can see here, 86.59% accuracy. And we had a hypothesis early on that was going to, this might be, this might happen because we engineered a feature uh, in our training data, which essentially said, look, for each individual text message in the training set, what was its average cosine similarity to all of the spam messages in the training set? And we saw that that was actually a pretty good feature. It actually gave us a lot of power, a lot of predictive power in our cross-validation runs. However, we also hypothesized, we also worried that that feature may overfit because the characteristics of spam in the training set may not necessarily be the same as the characteristics of spam in the test set. And ergo, that feature may be very, very powerful, but only in terms of the training data. And this has this hypothesis has been borne out by what we see here, which is this accuracy, which is far lower than what we saw in our cross-validation runs on the training data. And as we talked about before, one common definition of what is known as overfitting in machine learning is when you do much, much better on your training data, as measured by cross-validation, than you do on test or unseen data, which we see here. And we said, even worse yet, than 11 point drop in accuracy was the actual behavior that we saw, which essentially the, the predictions from the Mighty Random Force said, look, none of the test data is spam. It's all good. It's all good. And we know that to be patently false. But what we saw here essentially is the definition of overfitting. The model that we train cannot recognize spam anymore in unseen data because it is bound too closely to the training data. It is memorized, if you will, or it has almost memorized the characteristics of ham and spam in the training data. And by doing that, by being over-specialized, it isn't very good in the real world when it sees brand new data that it's never seen before. And this is what we see here. So what we said was, look, you know what, let's backpedal a little bit and let's take out the cosine similarity, uh, the similarity feature from the training data and see if we actually can get some generalization back into the model. So that's what we'll do t right now. So if you see here, that's pretty easy to do in R. If you, set, if you set a column on a data frame, a variable on a data frame to null, it gets removed. So what I'm doing here in these two lines of code is I'm removing the spam similarity from the training data and the spam similarity uh, feature from the test data, getting rid of it. We're keeping text length because we saw that text length was, was a good feature because not only did it raise our overall accuracy, it simultaneously raised both our sensitivity and our specificity. And we hypothesized that, well, that's probably indicative of a good feature. So we should probably keep that one in. So that's what we're going to do here. So I've, I've actually ran this code previously uh, just so that you wouldn't have to wait to see it run. And you'll see why in a second. Uh, so I won't run these two lines of code because I already have. Now next up, I'm running this code and the code in the GitHub, this will be really, really, this will be really, really important. The code in the GitHub, it will be configured for 10 logical cores. I actually ran this on my laptop, which is what I use to record the videos. So I turned the cluster cores down to three because I only have four logical cores on my laptop. So you will want to adjust this number based on the power of your machine. That is the CPU, how many cores, how many logical cores it has. By default, the code is set up to run on a workstation class machine with at least 10 logical cores. So be sure to change this if you run the code directly. Otherwise, you'll get your, your computer will not be happy with you. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Okay, so to give you some idea of the execution time here, um, I've as we've seen in the code, I've just set up a poor man's uh, you know, timer, essentially, for recording how long it took to run the code. So I set up a cluster here using the do snow package, and I'm asking it to use three logical cores. I started my timer. Uh, I then set the seed, and the reason why I did this was I wanted to ensure that if anyone who run this code directly would see 
the same results that I see. And the easiest way to do that with a random forest is just to explicitly set the seed. Now, I wouldn't do this in a production scenario, but since this is a tutorial, a teaching tool, and it, it helps when students see the same thing on their local machine as they do on the video, that's why I'm setting the seed explicitly here. Now, I'm doing another cross-validation run. This is everything we've seen before. I'm trying to predict the label, ham or spam, based on the rest of the features. I'm using a mighty random forest. I'm using the same control, train control setup that we've been using all along, which is tenfold cross-validation, repeated three times. I'm also asking, per the usual, that Carrot use seven different values of the M try parameter, the number of features that are given to each split in each decision tree in the random forest, to find out which one of those values works the best in terms of accuracy. And then we stop the cluster when we're done, and we take take a, another timestamp so that we can actually say, okay, how long did this execute? And if I scroll down here, you can see the results. So on my, on my laptop using three cores, this took 2.5 hours to run. So just to give you some idea <laughs> of, of how intense this is, uh, obviously if you have more cores, it's gonna run faster, uh, but it took two and a half hours. So I just basically, uh, fired this off and then went off and hung out with my wife while it executed in the evening. But what we get out of that essentially is a, uh, a nice random forest. And of course, actually, you know what, let's go ahead and take a look at what we see here in terms of our predictions. So I'm using the cross-validation run and the predict function will automatically pick out the best final trained random forest automatically and create predictions on our test data set. And then we're using the confusion matrix function out of the caret package per our usual. And we can see the results here. So you'll notice that our accuracy jumped up a lot by almost 10%. So we had, what did we have before here? We had 86.59%. And now we have 96.47%. So almost a 10% jump in accuracy by removing that, the, the, the spam similarity feature. So we kept text length in, and then we had our 300 features that we engineered, that we extracted using singular value decomposition, latent semantic analysis. And you can see here that we get a generalization score very, very close to what we saw uh, in or with our training data using our tenfold cross-validation run with the text length added, but not the spam similarity feature added. And this is good. Because what this does is this is a strong indication that we have built a generalizable model. Now, what's, what's a little bit disconcerting, though, is this, is that what we don't get is nearly the balanced uh, performance in terms of sensitivity and specificity that we saw in cross-validation. And this is, this is, not, this is, this is common, by the way. This, these results that we see here are common. They typically won't be as good on unseen data as they are on training data. That's just kind of the general rule. This is actually quite good, you know, as measured by overall accuracy. But when we drill in on the sensitivity and specificity, specificity in particular here, we can see that we've given some stuff up in terms of actual performance and unseen data when we compare it to the performance as measured by our cross-validation repeated three times. We saw that our sensitivity and specificity were both very, very good. They were in the 90s before, but now what we see here is we're very, very good at correctly predicting ham, but we're not very good at correctly predicting spam. Now, here's, here's in, if we look at the confusion matrix, we can actually see the trade-off and put it in the context of what the end user experience was going to be like. So we can see here that, so our prediction of ham was great. So we, everything that was ham, we got 100% correctly which was good, right? Because we, we hypothesized that in the real world, our customers would prefer us never to misclassify their actual legitimate text messages as spam. They would, you know, because they may not see them because they may go to a spam folder, you may just pull them out of the feed or whatever. So we hypothesized that, look, we would, we would, we very much want to make sure that all the ham gets through from a business perspective. That, and that's a, that's, a, that's a reasonable approach. So that's, that's the good news is that right now, we perfectly predict all the ham. Now, what the bad side is, is we do, we do let a little bit of spam through, right? Which is why our specificity is quite low. Because you can see here that out of all of the 
uh, spam messages, 59 of them, almost um, actually more than a quarter of them actually get through. Right? Our census, our specificity says, look, we only get, we only classify correctly spam about 73.66% of the time. So that means more than 25%, more than one in four spam texts get through. But our overall accuracy is quite high, 96.47%. And given the nature of the business problem, that maybe a little bit of spam getting through, but all the ham always gets through, might not be such a bad thing. This may be a reasonable trade-off in the business world. And this is something that you see often when you do text analytics models in production, which is nothing's ever going to be perfect. So you need to negotiate with the decision makers to say, okay, look, you know, here's what we can do. Is it acceptable from a business perspective? For me personally, my gut would tell me this is this is not bad. This is not bad. Now, could it be improved? Absolutely. Absolutely. And we'll talk more about that in some slides at the end, towards the end of the video. But right now, this is pretty good. I think this is this is great that we've got 96.4% accuracy on our test holdout, on brand new unseen data. This is a very, very strong indicator that, in fact, you can use historical text messages as embodied by our data set. You can extract features from it, and you can build models that, in fact, are useful for future unseen data as measured by our test holdout here. So this is really, really cool. OK, so lastly, Let's take a look at uh, our cross-validation run so we can compare what the cross-validation estimates were vis-a-vis -vis our um, test holdout. So here you can see the results from a cross-validation run. And Carrot says, look, Dave, I tried out seven different values of mTRI using tenfold cross-validation repeated three times, and I found that the best value out of the seven that I tried was 101. And you'll see here that the accuracy as measured by the cross-validation runs is about 97%, which is actually very, very close to what we see here, right? Only a little over maybe a half a percent difference. So this is great. This is great. This tells you that given the feature set that we have, you know, the feature hit, the, fe the 300 features that we extracted using SVD, text length only, seems to be a very good set of features, very generalizable, as measured by both not only our cross-validation run, which is an estimate of generalization error, but also as embodied by our test holdout set, which is an even more indicative estimate of what our error rate or accuracy, reflexively our accuracy, will be in production. Okay, so there you have it. That'll conclude all of the code for this series. You've got a firm foundation in text analytics now. It's a great introduction. We'll flip over to some slides now so that we can talk about, for those of you that are interested in pursuing text analytics further, what your next steps may be. Okay, for those of you that are interested in exploring text analytics further, and hopefully I've whetted your appetite for text analytics, it's, it's one of my absolute favorite things and, and, and wildly, wildly useful in practice. Okay, so in general, what's next? So, okay, Dave, what, what should I tackle next? If I'm interested in learning more about it, what can I do? Well, you can take the code. You can take the data that we've been using throughout this series and you can actually expand upon it. You can actually engage in some additional feature engineering exercises on your own to see if you can improve the score. Right? We saw that our sensitivity was 100% on our test holdout, but our specificity was quite low, around 73-ish percent. So there's a lot of opportunity there to maybe engineer some better features that could improve that performance. So for example, could, what about adding trigrams and four grams? Five grams, six grams? That may be helpful. It's something to try out. We only used unigrams and bigrams in this, and we got a pretty good score. So maybe if you went to trigrams as well, maybe you'd get better performance. Also, you never know as well, you may, may find that using just bigrams, and so we're using unigrams and bigrams, but maybe you just try out bigrams by themselves, and maybe bigrams work better than bigrams and unigrams, or bigrams and trigrams. There's a whole bunch of different combinations that you can try if you're interested. And sometimes uh, an unintuitive combination may actually work better than, than what you start with. So for example, and I'm just making this up, maybe the combination of two grams and four grams, but not one grams and three grams, just two grams and four grams actually works the best. Sometimes it's entirely possible that could happen. So there's a lot you can explore there. We also engineered text length. We saw that text length was a good generalizable feature. Well, at least measured by our test holdout set, it was a good generalizable feature. We also engineered 
Spam similarity, that turned out to be not so good. But there may be other features like text length that you could engineer. So it may be worth some time in, in, in a benefit of your of your skill building to say, look, you know, what are some other features that I could potentially engineer and test them out to see how they work. Now, next up, algorithms. So we leveraged a mighty random forest, and that was purely an arbitrary decision on my part, mainly because they are uh, a good general purpose algorithm. They're not always the best in every situation, but they are a good general purpose algorithm, and they're very easy to tune, which is why I chose to use them. However, it may not necessarily work the best on this data set. So for example, could you get better performance if you use boosted decision trees? Something like the mighty XGBoost package in R may actually give you better performance than, than a mighty random forest. So you could try, try that out. Also, uh, almost a de facto standard in the text analytics space is the use of support vector machines or SVMs. You could certainly try out SVMs as well. Uh, they may actually work better than a mighty random forest. And as we talked about previously, the reason for that is, is that text analytics features tend to be very, very low signal. Remember we said, look, that text analytics explodes your feature space, explodes the number of columns that you have, but those columns are mainly empty because of the sparsity problem. Ergo, each individual column doesn't have a lot of predictive signal in it. And as we saw, the, the Mighty Random Forest worked much better with uh, SVD collapsed down features to 300 rather than working with all you know, 22,000-ish features. SVMs tend to actually work okay in high dimensional spaces where each individual variable, each individual column has a low amount of signal, which is why they're commonly used in text analytics. So that may be something you may want to try. And then lastly, you can always learn more, more ways to analyze, understand, and work with text. I mean, this, this, is, just, this is just the tip of the iceberg, what we've covered. I know it's about six hours of content, but it's just the tip of the iceberg. So on this last bullet, I wanted to expand on this and give you some, some interesting resources that you may find useful if you want to pursue text analytics more in depth. Okay, so here's what I always recommend. This book by Matthew Jock, Jock I think it's Jockers maybe, Jockers, I'm not quite sure how you pronounce the gentleman's last name. Anyway, so he's a professor and he works essentially in a literature department at a university here in the United States. And oddly enough, lots and lots of folks who study literature at university in the U.S. are getting into R. They're doing a lot of text analytics these days. So he wrote a book specifically on how to do text analysis with R for students of literature. So this is really, really cool for a couple of reasons. One is this is arguably the best introduction that I've found to thinking analytically about text. You think about it, if you're a literature student, let's say you're getting a PhD in English literature, let's say, and you want to analyze the literature that you're doing, you need a guide. You need, you need to think about it in, in, in a very analytical way. And this book is really, really great about introducing the basics of how you think about text analytically. So this is great for that. Because it was written specifically for literature students, folks who most likely do not have strong mathematics or programming background, it is extremely accessible to a broad audience. I mean, if you've never coded R before, uh, you actually, you could probably learn a lot of R coding and a lot of goodness just by reading this book, just to start with. This is just great for that. Also, the book also illustrates some, some techniques that we don't cover in this series. For example, it covers topic modeling, which is a very, very useful technique in text analytics. Uh, you can create topic models, and then you can, and the book shows you how to create topic models and then visualize them as word clouds. People love word clouds, and, and for good reason. They're a good way to gain a high-level understanding analytically about maybe the themes or topics that are going on in a, in a body of text. So there's a lot of goodness in this book. So I always recommend people start here if they're really getting serious about text analytics. So next up is a book called Taming Text. Now, this book is actually written for Java programmers. Now, you may be saying, Dave, heresy. Dave, this is heresy. What are you doing? The reason why this book is super useful is that there is a lot of theory in the book. I mean, honestly, if you, if you didn't feel inclined to understand the Java code that's actually in there, it's okay. I would still say read the book anyway because it teaches, teaches you a lot about of theory. And there are packages that implement all the theory that is talked about in this book. And this book is very, very, uh, it's very, very well written. It's not very long. It's not particularly dense. 
mathematically. It covers a lot of good theory, and then what it does is it provides you a nice foundation. And then later on, when we go look at the uh, when we go look at the library of our packages that do text analytics, you'll understand what the packages are used for because this book will teach you the theory. Now, probably most importantly is there is good coverage in this book about the Open NLP package. Now, Open NLP was originally written in Java. There is an R wrapper called Open NLP. That's the name of the package that wraps this. So you can actually use Open NLP from R, and it actually does a lot of really cool things, like part of speech tagging. It allows you to help you write, do chunking and things like that. So reading this book will teach you about the Open NLP package, and this is directly directly relatable to R because R has a wrapper for it. So this is a great book. Okay, so once you've read those first two books, you're going to get a good foundation for text analytics. The first book will teach you a lot of practice and some ideas about analysis of text. Uh, Taming text will teach you a lot about the theory. And then it's time to actually go say, okay, look, you know what, I know enough. Let's go see what R offers for me. So the first thing that you want to do is you want to go to uh, the NLP task view on CRAN. I mean, literally, you can just Google this right here. Just Google this right here, CRAN NLP task view, and you'll get the page. You click on it, and what you'll get is a big, long list of all of the packages in the R universe that work with text analytics. Uh, if you're not familiar, NLP stands for natural language processing. You can kind of think of it as a synonym for text analytics. After you've studied taming text in particular, you'll know so much more about what these packages, um, uh, what they do and what they would use, what they would be used for and how you would structure them in as part of your pipeline and as part of your solution. So that's why I recommend reading Taming Text first. And then go to the CRAN NLP task view, and then you're off and running. Okay, next up, here's an easy way to think about um, search. Think about Google, think about Yahoo, think about search in SharePoint, you name it. On Amazon's website, on Netflix's website, you name it, right? Search is everywhere. Search? is basically a text analytics problem. So actually studying information retrieval, which is the, uh, the branch of computer science, if you will, that focuses on search, is actually a good idea. There's a lot of goodness to be gleaned from it. And this book right here is the single best resource for IR for beginners. This is great, information retrieval. It talks a lot about um, some of the concepts that we discussed today. It talks about singular value decomposition and LSA. In, in, Information retrieval, they call LSA, LSI, latent semantic indexing, but it's essentially it's the same thing. This book talks a lot about the vector space model. It talks about cosine similarity. It talks about naive Bayes. It talks about a lot of stuff. So this is a really, really good book for you to go into to expand your knowledge and understand it more because think about it, right? If, if I've got to search through mountains of text, I need to do text analytics and understand those features and structure my solution in such a way that my search engine gives you relevant results. Most of these tools and techniques are useful also for classification as well. So the good news is, is that you can buy this book. You can certainly buy it from Amazon, but it's also available free online from Stanford. So this is great. This is a, it's a great resource. You can just read it online. It's free covers awesome amount of stuff. So I highly recommend this book as well for folks once they reach a certain stage of text analytics and they're interested in going further and further and further. And then lastly, Python. Now, those, those of you who have uh, either attended my talks or have attended the Data Science Dojo Bootcamp know that I am an R aficionado. I am an R fanboy. I do use Python occasionally, and typically the only time I use Python is text analytics, and the reason for this is simple. Python has the natural language toolkit, the NLTK. It is pure, unadulterated awesomeness. In R, you can do everything with text analytics in R that you can do with Python. Don't get me wrong, you can absolutely do this. There's no problem. The only downside is that in R, you typically have to use a number of packages to get it done. In Python, you've got a one-stop shop. It's the NLTK. So this is, it's a really, really good, powerful library. Not surprisingly, the book about it is also extremely useful for our programmers doing text analytics as well, because this, this book contains a lot of theory. You know, it talks about chunking, it talks about a lot of natural language processing, a lot of text analytics techniques, 
that you can all do with R with the right packages and everything. You can totally do it in R. But there's not a really necessarily uh, that I found such a, a good solid resource for it. So I just say, look, you know what? Just read the NLTK book. This book, you can get it online. It's free. It's online. It's free. You can get it. You can just you can just Google it and you can find uh, find it. Uh, you can either read the version three or the version two b- book. It doesn't matter because if you, I'm, you're looking at it from an R perspective. So it doesn't really matter. There's a lot of good theory in there. And once again, as with the Taming Text book, you don't necessarily need to learn the Python syntax if you don't want to. You can kind of ignore it. The idea is just to read the book and understand the concepts and the theory about why you do the things and what kind of benefit that you do. Okay, there you have it. If you go through this list of things that I just provided and study them in detail, you will be very, very far along in terms of text analytics. You will be able to do a lot of really awesome, cool things in your daily work. So there you have it. That's the end of the series. I hope you've enjoyed the series. I've had a lot of fun making it, and I hope that everyone finds it extremely useful. As always, if you like what we're doing here on the Data Science Dojo YouTube channel, please subscribe. That way you can keep abreast of all the latest tutorials that we post to the channel. Also, if you have any questions or concerns, feel free to use the comments section of this video. We at Data Science Dojo monitor our channel regularly and try to answer any and all questions promptly. Next up, if you like what we do in at Data Science Dojo more generally, you can follow us on social media. We're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we're on LinkedIn. And if you start following us, you'll be able to tap into a nice steady stream of data science goodness that you may find useful in your daily work. And lastly, I hope to see you in an upcoming Data Science Dojo Bootcamp. This is Dave Langer signing off, and I wish you very happy data sleuthing.